All right, since Arlong Park, we have been building up to Fishman Island. This was an anticipated arc for me as it connects Nami, Arlong Park, Sabaody, and even Amazon Lily all to Fishman Island. I had a lot of predictions on Fishman Island, almost all of which I got wrong. I was expecting Fishman Island to be more destroyed or to be in the midst of external problems with the Straw Hats being the ones to come in and stop it. Instead, we end up hyper-focusing on the internal problems of Fishman Island, with most of the problems plaguing Fishman Island during this arc coming from within themselves. I wasn't expecting to encounter Big Mom in this arc. I wasn't expecting Fishman Island to be the closest thing to Atlantis that we were probably going to see. I wasn't expecting literal King Neptune, I didn't think we would go for that, and if we were to see a Kraken, I would have expected it to see it in the surface and not in the depths of Fishman Island. So this is an arc that I was just absolutely excited to experience. The first couple of chapters focuses on the ambience of the sea, what logic is being used, how currents flow from and to Fishman Island, the many varied landscapes of the ocean itself, from bright shining waters to the dark depths to the volcanic landscapes, even like Fishman Island itself has varied landscapes. It has the forest, Kami's darker section of the city, Neptune's bright kingdom, or the colorful uh, coral cities that these people inhabit. From a writing perspective, having to traverse a large amount of space to get to Fishman Island also means that a lot of this early section of Fishman Island allows us to have a lot more character interaction. Whether it's ignoring Nami or fighting the Kraken, it's just nice to see this early section of the story considering how the crew is then later split up into three-ish sections later on in this arc. We also get like a ton of world building, even if most of the crew just doesn't want to hear about sailing density levels. I want to hear about sailing density levels. That's really cool. It's something that I didn't expect One Piece to talk about because, well, most pirate stories never talk about that. At most, they're like, oh, big wave coming, and that's it. All right, I'm going to label this section as moments. There are just a lot of things here that I like, but that I don't really think have relevance in this arc. So I'm just stuffing them here. Probably the most interesting one being the fact that Aokiji and Akainu fought. Like, you can't just tease us here. I want to see the ramifications of this, please. I like a lot of the callbacks to Arlong Park, such as Momu. There's actually a lot of things in this particular arc that makes it feel more alive, even if we barely touch on them. Like Mr. Tom's brother that Frankie visits. All of these mermaids that hang out with the Straw Hats for a brief moment. Kami, Hachi, and the Starfish being in this arc. Even all the important fishmen that helped Neptune. There are also less important characters like Haribu, who I thought would be at least a little bit more important than he was, but he was ultimately just like a joke character. Or Vander Decker, who plays a pretty big role in the story, but as a character, I don't really think anyone cares about Vander Decker. If anything, he is just like the vehicle to push Luffy and Crybaby's narrative, which is fine. I like the Luffy's enjoyment of adventure and freedom pushing Crybaby into exploring while he sticks around and tries to protect her like an escort mission in a video game. So when we actually get to Fishman Island, there are some aggressive fishmen right off the bat. There is Vander Decker and the new Fishman Pirates, which start to give us a broader context to the overwhelming fear and prejudice that comes from Fishman Island. The inciting incident of which ultimately escalating in uh, Sanji and nosebleeds. As much as I hate that cliche. But I'm gonna defend it. If this happens outside of Fishman Island after this arc, I'm gonna take my word back on this. But in this arc, I kind of like the nosebleeds. It's dumb. Don't get me wrong. It is designed to be dumb. And I think it also reflects how something this dumb and lighthearted, something that should not be an issue has gotten so severe, especially when you compare it to Fishman Island's reaction to humans. The fact that everybody here is fine, the fact that nobody's really an enemy worth attacking, the fact that these people hardly even know each other at all, and yet there is such an antagonistic vibe towards each other. The fact that you deny someone's humanity without even knowing them says so much about the One Piece world in this arc. That being the prejudices, fears, feeling of superiority and hatred that is deeply rooted in Fishman Island. So let's talk about those. 
this is the part of the story that I really like because it's not shonen. A lot of the story of One Piece has been focused around fighting, sure, but one of the things that really interests me is what the Straw Hats don't solve. After every battle, after every place the Straw Hats leave, there is this more complex societal issue that needs to be fixed. And one of the interesting things about One Piece is observing the broader story outside of the Straw Hats' adventure and how the Straw Hats enter it for a brief period of time and are quite literally the last straw that will break all of this down. That being said, Fishman Island, in more ways than one, is not very subtle. While we have seen characters have certain philosophies like Nami, Akiji, or Kobe, all of which are solid, absolutely fascinating and complex philosophies in their own rights. In Fishman Island, on the other hand, we have Arahime, Tiger, and Hody, which are more caricatures at times, feeling more like a representation of a particular ideology and leaning so far into that aspect rather than being an individual character. That being said, when it's done right, it's interesting to see how these characters deal with the effects of slavery and oppression. I should probably start with Fisher Tiger since we knew about him back from Amazon Lily, with Fisher Tiger being the person who saved Boa along with countless other people, despite what he felt deep down about most of them. I think that's kind of the saddest part, especially if we look back on Boa's deep appreciation for Tiger, as well as Koala's gratitude when coming back to her village. This contrast in emotions between hating humanity and simultaneously empathizing too much to act against them, even keeping most of his emotions bottled within it, adds so much depth to his character. Tiger also pushed for like a more active approach, saving fishmen while also trying to be as non-hostile as a liberation approach can achieve. I also love the approach in showcasing that even if this is technically one faction, at least at the time, it had multiple ideologies, all of which wanted to approach this very differently, with this ideology spreading and getting distorted to many other fishmen. The saddest part about Tiger is the irony and tragedy of his death, with it later being a setup for the beautifully paid off section of Luffy and Jinbei. On the other hand, we have Arahime, who, unlike Tiger, took an extremely passive approach going for a long-term impact. That meant getting votes, changing the system, striving for peace in a non-aggressive fashion, even going so far as to choose to preserve the life of a celestial dragon who... Well, I'm surprised she even did that, honestly. In fact, most evidently, we see many characters, if not question her judgment, then at least worry profoundly upon her judgment, with the most risky play being that of the Revy. Revi? Revy, Reverie. Reverie? Reverie. A state of being pleasantly lost in one's thoughts. A daydream. A fanciful or impractical idea or theory. Oh, that's <laughs> that's sad. That's kind of that's kind of resonant to the story. Okay, okay, wow. Okay, so either one, the reverie is Adahime's dream being brought into reality. We've had a lot of themes of dreams being passed on to others. We see everyone near the end of Fishman Island hoping to make her dream become a reality, and you know that's the good ending. Or two, these dreams are going to get crushed and nothing will be fixed or made worse. It's a daydream. It's an illusion. It's something that's not going to happen. Uh, this makes more sense to me from a storytelling perspective because, well, in a story, you can't have things ever go right. But also because I don't believe that the world government would do that. We saw Sabahodi. We've seen the world government. I, I kind of doubt it. So the other way we could take this is her dreams getting crushed by reality and it is not going to turn out well, which is the bad ending, but I think historically the more realistic one. And lastly, we have Arlong, who I think his story is beautifully tied into Fishman Island. We see how over the course of being in the Fishman Pirates, he becomes more aggressive with him seemingly ignoring a huge part of Tiger's uh, long-term plan. I love Arlong's role here. It adds complexity even within the Fishman Pirates as a faction, which I think makes it better when they get split up as both the symbol and the faction itself now represent varied ideas. 
I think Erlang also plays a pretty huge role here, having a very different ideology from everyone else, showcasing not just hatred, but resentment towards humanity through his version of Sabaody Park. Being a place where we've seen Kami before, equally looking at it in amazement and despair. It adds just like a few more layers of complexity outside of just grrr, I hate human. Which Hody Jones I, is just that. I mean, like he just hates humans. Absolutely resents them for everything they've done. And beautifully ironic that he's one of the few characters that had no contact with humans. He is a character whose resentment lies not in experience, but in hearsay. He heard humans do bad things and heard fishmen hate humanity, and he furthered that hatred. This toxicity eventually leading into the death of Arahime and the hatred of his own species. Something that both Tiger and Arahime tried to stop. Lastly, I also want to talk about this like light versus dark metaphor which is uh, this theme that I've noticed from post Enoslavia and even before that of character names, fruit abilities, and metaphors uh, accumulating with a Straw Hats being the ones who will challenge the darkness, which is usually the antagonist of the arc. In Fishman Island, though, I would have been talking about this if we were just left with the Adam and Eve trees as well as like Noah's Ark, but we're also just getting way more than that. Fishman Island makes all of these metaphors really literal. It has characters constantly mentioning having dreams of the sun. It has uh, the fishman pirates going from the shadows of slavery to being converted into the light. It has fishmen being bathed in darkness and clinging on to the small bits of sunlight gifted from Eve. Later on, we get mentions of Fishman Island having a dark and looming shadow over its dark history. We get Jimbe and by extension Fishman Island begging Luffy to be the light that will destroy their dark history. And right after that's mentioned, we get the Thousand Sunny that like comes shining down upon Fishman Island. Right? I could go on about this for hours. I am drowning in the amount of times this is mentioned. So clearly, this is like a major theme of the story. And what I'm interested in is the fact that Luffy rejects this narrative. While near the end, he does end up being a hero regardless of his opinion, Luffy himself just fundamentally disagrees with the idea of being a hero. So on the one hand, you have the light versus dark metaphor, and on the other, Luffy is straight up rejecting being the light. Now, I don't think Luffy is just going to become a bad guy by rejecting the light. That feels very uh, fan fiction-y in a way. At most, I like the idea of him being kind of like Roger or Whitebeard, a person who the greater world might have disliked, but those around him would have seemed to have enjoyed. Being a hero just isn't a worldview that he wants projected onto him. Luffy and later Zoro's ideals were that heroes have to share and pirates don't. In other words, Luffy wants to be free, and heroism comes with restriction. This is also a good time to talk about hockey abilities. I was holding back on talking about hockey because I wasn't really sure how well it was going to be used, but I ended up liking hockey a lot. My biggest fear was that Conker's hockey specifically was mostly a way to deal with low-level grunts. It's a way of saying, we got a huge army, but in actuality, uh, who cares? And uh, that is what ended up happening. Luffy's Conqueror's Hockey was used to take out like half of the army. But I was kind of okay with it because I mean, come on, Conqueror's Hockey is pretty cool. When like a sea monster is like going towards him and he just goes, hush, come on, that's, that's cool. <laughs> I mean, especially because it's not a spammed ability. I actually like it more uh, when it was used in an earlier section of the story. When Luffy was tied up and was being stopped by the fishmen, and despite feeling bad for doing it, he had to use Conqueror's Hockey to put everyone trying to stop him down because he needed to go save Crybaby. I like that. It shows a lot of restraint from Luffy because Luffy is choosing not to impede his will onto others. We also get Armament Hockey, which is interesting. It has a black coating around it, and I mean, like, yeah, that's pretty neat, I guess. Maybe it adds a little bit more protection from the sea. It doesn't seem to do much, but just like maybe hit harder. But I really like the predicting one. I forgot the name of it. 
throughout the arc, we see Luffy reacting before like any other character uh, through a slight like shing effect, which I think is the hockey that's being shown. Like once or twice, it's used like in a different context, but usually it's a quick reaction that other characters are too late to process. So I think that's the ability. And if it is, I like it. It's subtle, but it's effective. There's also a lot of abilities that I don't have much to say about besides uh, these are cool. Here is a quick list of things that I thought were cool. Sanji can run on water. Sanji broke gravity. Robin makes giant limbs. She can crush people by stomping on them with her feet. Frankie Robot is pretty cool. Chopper has this form. I think he looks pretty good in like most of his new outfits. Monster Point is used in like two panels and not really shown in the manga. And I'm sad and it doesn't really look as cool. I like that the crew takes over a Kraken and that it has a use later on in the story and also is given a small character arc. All right, now let's talk about Jinbei. I didn't really mention Jinbei alongside Arahime and Tiger, but Jinbei equally plays a huge role in Fishman Island. He not only plays the long con being cautious while both joining the world government and while going after Hody, contrast that to Luffy who just doesn't care. If Luffy sees a problem, he's gonna go and fix it. Jinbei is also part of Nami's story and Fishman Island managed to give us a bigger glimpse into that. We see both his and Hachan's hesitation, their guilt and all. And it wasn't until Fishman Island where I kind of understood Nami even more. It's kind of been poking at me how she calmed down really quickly with Hachan in Sabaody, but with Fishman Island, it connects. Yes, they both messed up, and Nami could have chosen to not let them ever forget that. But here, she doesn't do that. Like Arahime and Tiger, she ends the cycle. After the entire fight, we again have blood being a major theme in this arc. Here's where we also see Chopper's importance as a doctor being one of the only people who can do a transfusion. And I think this is where this scene beautifully ties in with Fisher Tiger. And so it's beautiful to see the next generation, that being Jinbei, stepping in to do what Tiger uh, ultimately couldn't. Closing the cycle by doing something that was prohibited choosing to share the same blood. I love how this also parallels great with Adahime's line of not telling the next generation how to feel, but instead showing them and letting them decide. And that's what this arc accomplishes. Afterwards, we immediately see Luffy ask Jinbei to be a part of the crew, and we get Jinbei as a part of the crew. Kind of. He is again thinking about the long-termness of it all, like when he went with the world government or going after Hody, just like he was allied with Big Mom. He is really trying to plan out the long-term stuff here. So in the end, it's kind of like a Vivi situation. He is a straw hat in our hearts. All right, let's talk about Big Mom. Following Marine Ford, I was expecting major consequences for Fishman Island, though it ended up being kind of safer than I thought. And that was in part because, well, Big Bomb was there, protecting Fishman Island more so in a transactional sense, unlike Whitebeard. We got two lines about her before the time skip, so I wasn't expecting to, like, see her at all in this arc. The island she is on is, in fact, a candied island. Kind of. It's, it's a lot grosser, actually, uh, walking on frosting. I love the reveal of Big Mom. She's just like this imposing force bigger than life over these characters. And unlike Whitebeard, that size is used in a threatening manner rather than a heroic one. That being said, I did not expect Luffy to challenge Big Mom in this arc. Like, I know you had a trading arc and all, but really? You're challenging Big Mom now? I do have one question though, um, why is it all cake? Previously, we saw that it was raining candy back in Sabaody, and at the time, I thought that at most it was a devil fruit ability. But considering how Fishman Island is used purely for candy production, I think Big Mom is just that into candy. So maybe that candy rain is from a ship or a cloud that is actually transporting candy to equally pay their candy taxes to Big Mom. And lastly, I think this arc has some really interesting long-term ramifications. What I'm talking about is Madame Shirley's prediction of the destruction of Fishman Island. While Fishman Island was metaphorically destroyed and is now being rebuilt, Madame Shirley implied a more uh, physical destruction upon Fishman Island. 
So Madam Shirley has just revealed a lot of cards here, and we are setting up a few Chekhov's guns for like some future point of the story. We also have like the Poneglyphs, unlike the others. This one is not necessarily about a weapon. It is instead an apology. But it was such an important apology that it had to be carved into a Poneglyph. And it surrounded the failings of Joy Boy, who would, with the help of a mermaid, control Noah's Ark. Possibility 1. Noah's Ark is a ship for destruction. In some future point of the story, there's gonna be a ton of destruction, and that's what Noah's Ark is used for. Possibility 2. It's similar to actual Noah's Ark in the sense that it's a carrier vessel. Which could possibly lead to possibility three, is the whole world gonna flood? I don't think so. But it could also mean that at some point, a current location or multiple locations might not be safe, and Noah's Ark could be used to transport people out of there. This was apparently important enough to write into a poneglyph. Of course, King Neptune says that one day someone will fulfill this will. We've seen transferred wills throughout the story, uh, throughout this arc even. So again, we're setting up some will to be transferred again. And after all of this, Robin goes on to mention a third weapon, Uranus. <laughs> yeah, that's a weapon, all right. <laughs> so I think this adds even just more possibilities into the story, especially when you consider that one, Frankie knows how to make Pluton, two, the Straw Hats are destined to destroy Fishman Island, three, the Straw Hats have befriended Poseidon, and four, she could control Noah's Ark. There's a lot of potential ideas here, but honestly, uh, whatever I'm thinking of sounds way too fanfiction-y. So I'll spare you the pain and stop there. Oh, whoa, turns out I just found another Poneglyph. This one has all of the actual writing of all the fanfiction-y theories out there. Better, better not read that one. And also, uh, thanks to all of my patrons who could single-handedly pull Noah's Ark.